Lucifer, Satan, Beelzebub, Old Nick. The devil has many names and many different faces. Sometimes he appears as a monster, sometimes he's human. As the arch fiend ruling over hell, he's terrifying. But it wasn't always this way. If you go looking for the devil that we would recognise in this period, you don't find um, anthropomorphising images of the devil, um, sort of humanoid but with wings and um, a tail and cloven hooves. You don't find that. That's because the devil we know today is a human creation. This was probably the image they took to create the image of Lucifer or the devil. Owing more to the minds of artists than to the pages of the Bible. Invented and reinvented by generations for whom he became a tantalizing, perverse muse. It's a tumultuous, sadomasochistic fantasy. This is as much porno as it is inferno. The devil is a mysterious, seductive, and ambiguous character. But for nearly 1,000 years, there was no consensus on what he looked like. From the end of the Roman Empire to the cusp of the Renaissance in Italy, from the muddy fields of Gothic England to the libraries of the grandest French chateau, this film is about how artists invented Satan by taking the little the Bible says about him, letting their imaginations run riot, and challenging our fundamental understanding of good and evil. This is the mysterious story of one of the strangest, yet most electrifying figures in all of Western art, the devil. This is Ravenna in Northern Italy. This unassuming town was once just about the most important place in the world. It was the last capital of the Western Roman Empire. And in the early days of the Christian church, its citizens wrestled over the great religious questions of the day. Was Jesus divine? What was his relationship to God and the Holy Spirit? When the Basilica of Santa Polinare Nuovo was built in the sixth century, Many of the main beliefs of what we recognize today as Christianity hadn't yet been decided, including who or what the devil was. But I've come here because some people believe this is where his story begins. So if you come through this little doorway, you enter the basilica. It's really, this is a spectacular church. These splendid, glittering mosaics are how they would have been when they were first created. The 6th century is a critical era for Christianity because the iconography of the religion wasn't yet secured. There's no crucifixion here, for example. Even the appearance of Jesus varies. The important series of mosaics here for us is right at the very top up near the roof, about a metre or so high, where there are 26 scenes from the life of Christ. And somewhere in here, they say, is the very first depiction of the devil in Western art. And you have to look around to find it. It's not going to be on the side with the passion. It's somewhere up here. And in fact, here it is. If you look up there, there is a scene which is possibly the first, last judgment in Western art. And what we're looking at is Christ in purple, in the middle, and to his right is an angel dressed in red, and to his left is an angel dressed in blue. And that angel dressed in blue may well be Satan. How do we know it's Satan? Why do we think it's Satan? The answer is because in front of him you have these three goats. This is alluding to the story in the Bible from Matthew in which Christ comes in judgment at the end of the world and separates out the nations and humankind into the good, the sheep, who he places to his right, and the bad, the sinners, the goats, who go to the left. So there you can see the goats. He's, he's enacted that separation. And it's bizarre because... 
instead of the grisly ruler of hell who we're all familiar with, you have, from down here, someone who looks, well, he's radiant, he's glowing, he is a beautiful angel, he's quite ephebic. And of course he's blue, not red, which is exactly the opposite of what we might expect. In modern minds, red is the colour of hell, but in the sixth century, blue was the colour associated with darkness, with error. What's so strange about this image in particular is that, in a sense, it's an exception, it's a one-off. Um, there are no depictions of the devil that we know of which exist before this mosaic. Which kind of makes you think. Satan, supposedly central to Christianity, the personification of evil itself, seems to be completely absent from the artistic world for hundreds of years. And when he does turn up, he arrives with no pomp or ceremony, almost hidden amongst a grand programme of decorative mosaics. And not only that, he looks like an angel. But this blue angel doesn't convince everyone. Giovanni. Arguments have raged for decades about his importance and significance. Giovanni Gardini is a local religious historian and writer. Dei primi secoli è un'immagine che è completamente assente. E qui per Ravenna la cosa che viene messa forse più in evidenza di tutte è la gloria. E sempre sono sempre scene che mostrano e, e la potenza del Cristo, la, la grazia, la, la benedizione del Cristo. Quindi e, scene più positive. But what about this bloke up here, the, the, blue, the blue angel, the devil? No. Is the devil? <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I can see him. <laughs> allora, he has eh, the goats. <laughs> eh, sì, qualcuno ha visto il, il diavolo in, in quest'angelo azzurro, ma io credo che più genericamente si possa parlare appunto dell'angelo eh, dell della, della notte, eh, di questo, eh, è, è la notte, il colore appunto del, sì, del male in questo senso, ma eh, racconta più il, le tenebre eh, in senso molto generico. This argument about the blue angel encapsulates a big problem with the devil in early Christian art. There's no clarity about his image because there's no clarity about his role. I don't think that art historians will ever agree on whether or not that blue angel is meant to be the devil. There seems to be consensus that his colour is all about evoking shadows and the night to represent the erring ways of the goats or sinners in front of him. It's a deliberate contrast to Christ, who's associated with the light. But I don't think anyone could argue that he is the personification of malice or evil. He's, he's got this mysterious, unsettling aspect. He seems to emanate an aura of error, but there are no horns, there isn't a tail or a cloven hoof in sight, not even the merest whiff of sulphur. So he seems to be almost more like a heavenly functionary. He's a custodian of sinners, and he's not Satan as we know him today. But seeing the devil as an angel isn't as surprising as it might seem when you think of the theological context. A century before the Ravenna mosaic was created, Christian thinkers had fixed upon an ambiguous passage in the book of Isaiah. To them, it suggested that Lucifer, the most beautiful angel in heaven, had rebelled against God and been cast out of paradise. The fallen angel Lucifer had become the devil. But that was just about all contemporary artists had to go on. Satan isn't even mentioned in the book of Genesis. So does this mean the devil was simply a beautiful angel gone wrong? And if so, how did he become the figure we recognize today? The implacable enemy of God and the tyrant who rules in hell. Here, on the Venetian island of Torcello, there's a big clue about how the church and artists began to shape the devil and his role in the universe. 
Thank you. Glad to hear. Thank you. Perfect. I've come to Torcello, uh, which is the oldest populated island in the Venetian lagoon. And inside the basilica, which was founded in 639, is a stunning, monumental Byzantine mosaic, which dates from the 11th century. The thing is, I can see it, but when I go in, it's so holy in there that I'm not allowed to say a word about it. Which is actually kind of appropriate, because the artistic treasures inside the Basilica of Santa Maria Assunta really do leave you speechless. We don't know the names of the artists who created this glittering mosaic. But we do know that when it was completed in the 11th century, this was a blueprint of how the medieval church saw the world, the underworld, and the devil's role in both. The crucial point for me about this mosaic is that hell is very much part of the cosmic hierarchy. So in the second tier from the top, you can see Christ in the middle of an elliptical shape known as a mandala. And beneath him, coming out of the mandala, is a big red river of fire that cascades down several tiers into the depths of hell. Two of the biggest elements in that vision of hell aren't actually demons at all. They're angels. And the angels have long staffs, prodding at kings and bishops, nuns, from all over the world, as far afield as Egypt and the Orient their heads floating in the sea of fire. And fluttering around them are these little blue anti-cherubs. The figure who sits on the throne, who I love, is blue with wild white hair and a beard. And the throne has serpents' heads coming out of either side, eating, consuming sinners. And that blue ogre has a smaller figure sitting on his lap. Scholars disagree about who the little fellow could be. Maybe he's the personification of hell. Maybe he's Judas, the great traitor. He could even be the devil himself, who was sometimes known as the little master. But whoever that little guy is, I like to think of this blue giant as the real devil, because we're on the route towards some of the more grotesque and monstrous satans that would come to dominate the medieval imagination. I think this is a very revealing work of art. This blue giant looks like the prototype of the medieval Satan, with his wild hair and fiery domain. Five centuries after the Blue Angel of Ravenna, there's nothing angelic about him. Nonetheless, the definite impression here is that this Torcello devil is part of some medieval Christian workflow diagram. He's part of the divine plan, a cog in the cosmic machinery. I remember coming to this church several years ago and being really taken by the figure of that blue giant because you can tell by looking into his eyes, which look off into different directions, that there's something not right about this man. He's deranged. I think of him as like a psychotic jailer, let loose in the dungeon of hell with the blessing of God. The point about this figure is that weirdly enough, and as unexpected as it might seem, the devil seems to be on God's side. I've come to King's College in London to meet Dr. Sophie Lunn Rockcliffe, who studies the strange early days of Satan, to try to work out what role he played in the first centuries of Christianity. He's a bureaucrat. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. He's a kind of an ordinary guy, and actually there is no particular opprobrium that attaches to him as an individual. He's just doing his job. Even the nastiest judges and torturers who are taking a bit too much pleasure in um, kind of stripping Christians of their flesh and burning them alive, so quite often you'll find a sort of overarching, um, distancing, 
device of saying that this was all done according to the providence of God. What triggers this need for these early Christian fathers to be constructing a devil that we might recognise today? I think the need for a devil is actually quite an important theological and philosophical one. So the problem is that Christians face, and indeed non-Christians as well, is the big philosophical question, whence evil? Um, how does bad come into a good created universe? And the devil is incredibly important in helping to answer that question. And actually in the early Christian world, there really is that sense that the devil is everywhere, either in himself or through his kind of multiple minions, and that you can't trust the visible, tangible world because it's essentially deceptive. Which may explain why no one in this period church or artists seem sure about what the devil should look like. If you go looking for the devil that we would recognise from later medieval art, you don't find him. So you don't find um, anthropomorphising images of the devil, um, sort of humanoid but with wings and um, a tail and cloven hooves. You don't find that in this period. But there were plenty of other images around which could give Christian artists inspiration when they needed to depict Satan. Images of pagan gods once worshipped in Greece, Rome and Egypt. Among them, the Greek god Pan, who soon became a popular source of inspiration for Christian artists. I think early Christians had a strong understanding that the pagan gods existed and were demons, were evil forces. Um, and you can see that from early Christian literature, which refers to this idea of a world sort of humming with demons. There's a reference in Psalms which Paul picks up on, which says the gods of the heathen are demons. It's something that's already there in scripture, the association between the demonic and things worshipped by pagans as being gods. It's the demonization of that which was once thought to be divine, and it's a really interesting inversion. And there is a competitive element to it of saying, well, your gods are actually kind of minor demons and our god trumps them all. In the first millennium, Christianity was still very much in competition with ancient pagan religions. By demonising the gods and monsters of the ancient world, the church not only won converts to its own cause, it had also finally found a convenient model for Satan. The Ashmolean Museum in Oxford has one of the finest collections of pagan artefacts in Britain. These are the remnants of ancient religions that once stretched all the way from northern Europe to the Nile and included gods like the Egyptian deity Bez, who might provide some clues as to why the devil looks the way he does today. I found you three base figurines, which is basically an Egyptian deity. Um, looks like little demon. Curator of antiquities, Dr. Anya Ulbrich, has looked some out for me. He's quite ugly, isn't he? Yes, he definitely is. So these are all representations of Bez? Of the same deity, yes. It's and, and they're all, all Egyptian? Three. They are all Egyptian. So when do they for date from? Pretty late period, um, which means the first millennium BC. What's so noticeable is the sheer ugliness of this god. He's got very squat, flat features. Yes. Um, he's Tans heavily bearded. And it's interesting, of course, to think about the possible connections with later representations in Western art of the devil. Yes. Because there are some similarities. I mean, how much do you think that European artists were aware of the tradition of bears when they were thinking about representing um, the devil? Since these little amulets were exported all over the Eastern Mediterranean, people definitely knew the image of bears. But uh, he actually was worshipped as a demon who protects you against evil. It's actually a protective deity. So he's the opposite he's of the devil. He's actually the opposite of the devil, because as I said, this is a protective deity. We wouldn't consider the devil as a protective deity in Christianity. So not only did early Christians appropriate the imagery of a pagan god like Bez, but they also completely trashed his reputation. Bez, the lucky charm, the protector, became Bez, the grotesque monster. They demonised him, and other pagan gods suffered a similar fate. Right, so who is this? Well, this is a Greek satire. So he's one of the demons, half goat, half uh, horse sometimes, um, with a goat tail, uh, who celebrate the good life. Big beard, yes. pointed ears, goat ears, goat ears. Um, often very hairy flanks, lower half of their body, cloven yes. 
hooves, Cloven a hoof. tail. Yes. These are all attributes that were later co-opted by the devil. Exactly. This guy looks like Lucifer. Yes. Or rather, Indeed. Satan. Indeed. Lucifer's and this was probably the image they took to create the image of Lucifer or the devil in early Christianity. So when we're thinking about the gradual evolution of the way that the devil mm. looks in art, yeah. we can say that these are the chief figures in that whole hinterland of influences that went into it. Yes, because Christianity, of course, draws on the imagery known to create Christian images with new connotations. The fascinating thing here is that it's almost like he's the grandfather of the devil, if this is his dad. <laughs> yes, possibly. So you get, you know, this guy, the progenitor, yes. that's his offspring, and his offspring is the devil we know today. Indeed. What I'm discovering is that the early history of the devil is much murkier than I ever imagined. In the Bible, Satan has this official role as God's accuser or attorney general. He does God's dirty work, he tests and he obstructs, but his duties are surprisingly bureaucratic and also minimal. He's got more of a walk-on part, really, than a star turn. As long as Christianity is in flux, then Satan's role and image are also ambiguous. But when the imagery of pagan gods like bears and pan is borrowed by the church, then all hell breaks loose. Satan not only gets a much more definite look, but also he becomes imbued with characteristics of things that Christianity wishes to reject or considers morally dubious. This new devil is as much a human as a religious creation. He's leaving the pages of the Bible and entering the control of the church. And that makes the devil and the church much more powerful. This has to be one of the most memorable paintings to have survived from the Middle Ages. It's known as the Winchester Psalter. It's a whole collection of illuminated manuscripts, and this is one of the paintings. At the end of the world, the angel has cast that old wily serpent known as Satan down into this bottomless pit, the bottomless pit of hell, and he's sealing it, and he's locking the door so that no one can get out. And inside, you have all of the poor sinners. And the reason I love it is because I look at them and they're all topsy-turvy. They're going every single direction. It's almost as though the sinners are being sizzled in this infernal tumble dryer that you can see. In Torcello, the angels punished the sinners as the devil looked on. Here, the devil has a new role. He's right in the thick of the torture. And he seems much more powerful than previous devils. Now he commands legions of terrifying demons, all of whom are helping him in his diabolical work. Inside the jaws of the hell mouth, as this great beast is known, are all of these sinners in this fetid, cramped, very claustrophobic condition where they're being tormented by all manner of demons and devils, some with big bushy beards, which put you in mind of that Egyptian deity, Bez, some with pan-like bestial hair coating their bodies. Few have horns, some don't. They're delighting in tormenting all of these sinners. So we imagine within hell all these people being chewed up. You can see the great jaws, the teeth. They're not even canine teeth at the front of the mouth, they're molars, just to make that excruciating grinding process continue for as long as possible. When the Winchester Psalter was created in the middle of the 12th century, the artist behind it strained every sinew to make the devil more powerful and terrifying than ever before, the tyrannical leader of armies of crazed demons. And they wanted to bring the real world into hell too. The devil's victims include secular leaders like kings and queens, as well as heretical monks. The Winchester Psalter is the medieval church's enemies list. Whoever's created it has let their imagination run riot. That's what's so wonderful about this. It's a topsy-turvy, scatological, highly energetic, volatile, big fantasy of what happens in hell, in the afterlife. We'll probably never know the names of the individual artists who created this Psalter. And while it's safe to assume their vision of hell chimed more or less with that of the Church of the Day, I think it also looks like these artists really embraced this new devil. 
They seem to love the opportunity to depict ever more gruesome scenarios featuring Satan and assorted unfortunate sinners. And this was true across medieval England, where even great cathedrals like Lincoln became giant canvases on which artists could project some pretty dark fantasies. Dr. Nicholas Bennett is librarian of Lincoln Cathedral. So I'm a 13th century pilgrim, mm -hmm. and I'm approaching the cathedral from the south. But yes. before I go in, I'm confronted by this, this sculptural is a... design. That's right. Now, what this, am I looking at? This is a stark reminder of what happens to those who are not good in this life and the, what happens to those who are good. So there's one yes. of the dams. You can just see the dam's bum sticking out. Exactly. That's right, yes. <laughs> really quite close to um, the genitals of the demon On next the left, yeah. who's having a very um, satisfying experience, one would think. <laughs> I mean, that's actually quite prominent, really. I mean, there's no yes. point in... No, there's no messing about. No, we can't mm, sidestep is, that. No, Just above yeah. the door, leading yes, into the cathedral, exactly, yeah. is a very explicit, um, erect devil's penis. Yes. Why? Precisely. Well, it's all part of this um, very in-your-face sort of style. Um, it's, it's showing them that it's not a pleasant experience going to hell, uh, you're going to be manhandled by these grotesque, horrible demons, is going to be totally removed from the love of God, which is where you want to be. Art like this makes Satan a recognisably medieval character. The punishments and the humiliations he inflicts would have been immediately recognised by people whose lives were themselves tough and violent. While God remained ethereal and unknowable, Satan, in contrast, was found right in amongst all the sex, violence and brutality of medieval life. I feel like I've stumbled into uh, now, the film of the wicked Worship man, right? me as thy lord. This is a mystery play. These were first performed in France more than 900 years ago as a way of bringing important passages of the Bible to life. I am a devil. They became popular across Europe, from Germany to Italy to England. Show the might of thy grace. Lay people knew little about the arcane theological arguments of the church fathers, but they knew a devil when they saw one. And so these plays actually became the most influential representation so far of the devil in art. Often, painters copied the costumes and look that lay people had created. So the next incarnation of the devil's appearance came not from priests, but from the terrified imaginations of medieval lay people. Right, well, I think it may be conjures some of the spirit of the mystery cycle plays whereby Cosmic grand themes were made comprehensible in, at times, quite broad brush strokes to the masses. And this was the great tradition of, essentially, popular culture of the day. When mystery plays were at their height in the 13th and 14th centuries, they reinforced an image of Satan in people's minds, the all-powerful source of evil, the ruler of hell and a tyrant standing in opposition to God. The subtle ambiguity of the Ravenna and Torcello devils was long gone. Lo, I nourish sin for the confusion of man. Draw him to my dungeon in fire! This devil perfectly fitted a world where death could come quickly and horribly. Cities all over Europe were regularly savaged by the plague with devastating consequences. One of the most vivid first-person accounts of this terror was written by the Italian writer Giovanni Boccaccio. At all events, few of those who caught it ever recovered, and in most cases, death occurred within three days from the appearance of the symptoms. 
some people dying more rapidly than others. The stench of dead bodies, sickness and medicines seem to fill and pollute the whole of the atmosphere. In the face of so much affliction and misery, all respect for the laws of God and man has virtually broken down. As death raged across the continent, people saw the plague as nothing less than the work of the devil. In many ways, the Middle Ages were a period of calamity and woe. War, poverty, pestilence, famine, these were ever-present threats, and Europe was blighted with one epidemic after another of the bubonic plague, or the Black Death. In 1348, for instance, Tuscany was convulsed by the plague. Half of the citizens living in Florence were wiped out. In Siena, 65% of the population were killed. You can imagine the fevers, running sores, the stench of rotting flesh and forgotten carcasses. It must have been a dreadful, precarious time to be alive. And that dreadful, dangerous nature of life in medieval Europe erupted in terrifying artistic visions of the Inferno. The original version of this devil is found in the baptistry, one of the most sacred churches in Florence. It was created around 1260 by an artist called Coppo di Marco Valdo. This is a Satan that is very close to my heart. He dates from a period where the look of the devil is starting to become crystallized. There are various attributes which point him out to be the devil. The strange, perverse, paradoxical thing is those attributes are actually quite miscellaneous. He's surrounded by all sorts of animals. There are the serpents on the throne, there's locusts, there are reptiles, there's a big fat toad. His head is horned. It's bald, it's bright blue. His torso is green. He has a thick beard with snaking goat's hair curls. And it's quite clear that this work of art was inspired by the bestiaries, the anthologies of fabled magical animals that were so beloved of medieval readers. The result is one of the most persuasive visions of Satan as the tyrant of hell. To the medieval onlooker, no doubt this was a thing of terrifying awe. They would have looked up at this devil and been scared witless. And I think you get a sense, looking at this hell, of the instability of the medieval world. Surely, Coppa di Marco Valdo was drawing on the ravages he saw around him when he created this warped, terrifying, grotesque devil. This is the ultimate diabolical image a perfect, horrible example of art reflecting the dreadful mood of the times. And this image was seen by a number of extremely important Italian artists and writers and thinkers. And two of them would go on to define the way we still think about the devil today. One of them was the Florentine artist and architect Giotto, who's often called the father of modern Western art. It was said of Giotto that he translated the art of painting from Greek into Latin, changing forever what painting could achieve. And his own greatest achievement is the interior of this chapel in the northern Italian town of Padua. I'm feeling exceptionally fortunate because it's very, very early in the morning and I've been allowed in here before the crowds come to have a look at Giotto's famous fresco cycle in the Arena Chapel. And it's completely spectacular, it's almost overwhelming. Behind me, here, is the most monumental fresco of all of the frescoes in this great cycle. It's a vision of the Last Judgment, which dominates the entire western wall of the chapel. Here in the Arena Chapel, at the turn of the 14th century, Giotto created the quintessential medieval vision of hell, with its monstrous pot-bellied Satan consuming, then excreting sinners. You can see the influence of the Florentine devil which was completed only a few decades before Giotto started work here. And there are older influences as well. We first saw these rivers of fire in Torcello more than two centuries ago. Like the real world around him, 
Giotto's devil is vicious, and the hell he inhabits is a nasty, brutal place. You see people being tortured in very specific ways. They're manacled, they're being whipped, they're hanged. There's a bloke who's been skewered on a spit. You can see Judas hanged with his bowels hanging out. He's been eviscerated. There's a number of sinners here who seem to be punished for sexual sins. The church has always had a slightly problematic relationship with sexuality, and we see that here. For example, by Satan's left hip, there's a tiny lizard-like green scaly monster that's chewing on a man's penis. And if you look up behind Satan to the right, there are four of the damned hanging, and two of them have been strung up by their genitals. It's a catalogue of inventive, diabolical sanctions. But the real story of the Arena Chapel, I think, is that this devil is in some ways the least innovative part of the whole cycle, both theologically and artistically. Though there are fascinating elements of the real world here, the power of this last judgment as a piece of art pales in comparison to what Giotto has been able to achieve elsewhere. In the other panels, there's a revolution going on. The way that people are depicted as three-dimensional, as beautifully and vulnerably human, marks a fundamental change in art. This is what they mean when they say that Giotto changed forever the language of painting. Seen in this wider context, Giotto's devil seems a little bit, well, unconvincing. And he isn't the only troublesome devil in the chapel. Giotto didn't just paint one devil in the arena chapel, he painted two. And the second one is just up there, where we see the scene in which Judas is taking money, and it's the moment that we know he's going to betray Christ. And you see in that image, in that fresco, part of the problem that Giotto faced when he was painting the devil because his genius in this spectacular space was that he was taking art history away from its Byzantine traditions, which were a bit more abstract, where things were not naturalistic. And he's introducing a much more recognizably everyday human sense into the way that artists perceive the world. These are real people located in real space. And then he paints the devil a figure who isn't from the real world, who isn't a human actor. And it's almost like he can't quite work out how to render him if he's not thinking about the pictorial and psychological reality of our world. Taking this being from Western imagination, from the church's teaching of the afterlife, and its panoply of cosmic beings, doesn't quite work here, because you can see that devil is almost two-dimensional. He's a shadowy cardboard cutout devil. What that fresco foretells is that Satan was going to have to evolve. Otherwise, he risked being eliminated from the art historical story altogether. <laughs> But Satan was rescued by another Florentine who'd visited Giotto while he was completing his frescoes in the Arena Chapel. Dante Alighieri was a young poet who'd found himself on the wrong side of a bitter political power struggle in Florence. By the beginning of the 14th century, he was in exile, never to return. By then, he'd begun work on an immense trilogy of poems called the Divine Comedy. And the most famous of these was Inferno, Hell. This epic poem would transform the way that artists thought about Satan. It has a very famous beginning. Halfway through our trek in life, I found myself in this dark wood, miles away from the right road. He's lost, spiritually lost, and he encounters a guide, the Roman poet Virgil, who leads him into the underworld. 
And Dante imagines this very schematic vision of hell. He sees it as a succession of circles, almost in a funnel shape, narrowing as we move towards the centre of the earth. And in each circle, he encounters different sets of sinners. Some are famous figures from classical mythology. Others, and this is part of the brilliance of the poem, are contemporary political figures, so that society of Italy at the time is referenced throughout the poem. Dante's almost getting his revenge, his own back, on various people. And the climax of Inferno comes right towards the end, in Canto 34, when eventually Dante and Virgil happen upon Satan himself. The emperor of that dire empire was stuck chest deep in the ice, and I'd come nearer to a giant than a giant would to his arm, so you see how enormous he was with all of him on this scale. If he's as ugly as he was lovely when he stood up to his maker, all pain indeed derives from him. And his six eyes weep, his three chins drip with tears and gory slaver. In each mouth his teeth grind away at a sinner. One of the big differences about this Satan is we're moving away, even though it's around about 1300, from the medieval conception of the devil as this odd overlord of hell, the ruler of hell idea. Here it's quite different. We're invited to imagine how beautiful he was as Lucifer before he fell and to imagine him as the origin of all sorrow in the world. This is a psychological thing. We're being invited to have a... In, to, to imagine his own mental hell. Dante does what Giotto doesn't. He makes Satan three-dimensional. There are the first hints of empathy with the devil in this poem. His Satan is fundamentally different from either of Giotto's devils in the arena chapel. And it's no accident, I think, that artists who came later took Dante as their inspiration, not Giotto. Romantic artists like Gustave Doré loved the Inferno, and they played on the tragedy of the devil when they illustrated the poem centuries later. Dante's Satan is a vision that would ring down through the ages. Milton was thinking directly about the Divine Comedy when he wrote Paradise Lost. And I don't think you could find his Satan with all of his grandeur without a conception of the devil, which Dante offers, which moves us forwards towards the modern world. And this is important because as soon as Satan enters the real world, as soon as he is physically defined and treated in a human way, then in a sense, he ceases to be Satan and becomes something else, a much more human, much less supernatural image of evil. This is such a radical change that it poses an important question. Who's now in charge of what the devil looks like or represents? Is it the church or is it the artists? By the 15th century, this battle was being waged on the streets of Italy. In Florence, an apocalyptic preacher called Girolamo Savonarola took over the city. He was obsessed with Satan and blamed the devil for turning Florentines into corrupt and avaricious sinners. His followers burnt books and arts that they considered subversive. Even for the 15th century, this was pretty old-time religion. Savonarola led a revolution that saw him become virtual dictator of Florence. And you might think that the church would support his puritanical campaigns against Satan and lust, but it didn't. In fact, it excommunicated him and burnt him and two of his lieutenants at the stake. But Savonarola's revolution had caused political chaos in Italy, and his hellish sermons resonated in towns and cities riven by clannish violence and famine. Among the crowds watching his death had been the artist Luca Signorelli, whose apocalyptic frescoes in the cathedral of the hilltop town of Orvieto captured the dangerous, uncertain mood of the times. It's a really beautiful cathedral. I love the uh, stripy effect of the brickwork. Anyway, the thing I'm coming to see is in a chapel 
down at one end of the cathedral. And this is it, with a bunch of tourists. It's kind of, on the outside, it's relatively spare. There's a that geometric feel of the cathedral itself. But in here, there's supreme embellishment everywhere you look. Spectacular, tumultuous effect where every single fresco has been overloaded with figures and the composition is fit to bursting. We see here a scene in which the Antichrist is giving one of his false sermons, reckoning in the final period of the apocalypse. To the right, here are the elect, the people who are chosen for heaven. They're about to be rewarded. They're being lifted up to heaven as we go over the altar. On the other side, people, sinners, are being plunged down towards hell. And then we move into this fresco where you see the punishment of the damned. Really brightly colored, actually. You come in and it's quite hard not to feel excited by this quite vigorous, quite modern, contemporary feeling approach. What's interesting about it that strikes me immediately is that hell is quite a light, bright place. There's no darkness. There is that claustrophobia in terms of the bodies all writhed and massing together, but there isn't that sense of the surrounds being some horribly oppressive sensation upon them. What you see are demons who are brightly coloured, but in many ways they're not actually that different to the sinners. It's a tumultuous, sadomasochistic, almost kinky, fetishistic fantasy. This is as much porno as it is inferno. And right in the middle, clutching a woman with her breasts not so far from his face, is a blue demon with a horn in the middle of his head. And lots of people, tradition has it, say that that is a self-portrait of Signorelli himself, one of the demons doing the tormenting. If that isn't an example of artistic sympathy for the devil, I don't know what is. Signorelli had recreated hell right here on Earth. Outside, people were dying in vicious political feuds or succumbing to the plague. Inside, the end of the world was depicted in minute, horrific detail and many have seen Savonarola, the revolutionary preacher, right at the centre of this work. The false prophet taking instructions from Satan before the end of the world is, the theory goes, a thinly veiled attack on Savonarola, whose obsession with the devil had caused so much chaos. È anche comprensibile l'immagine. Alessandra Canistra is a local religious historian. How popular is the chapel with tourists who come to the cathedral? Sì, molto popolare. E forse questo è dovuto in particolare alle immagini eh, di questi straordinari eh, demoni eh, che eh, probabilmente attraggono ancora più dei santi. È il punto più alto e eh, anche veramente l'inizio di una grande modernità. Eh, si chiude con il Medioevo e si apre eh, l'epoca dell'uomo. L'uomo è al centro, eh, l'uomo è al centro dell'arte, è al centro anche della religione. Eh, nonostante la presenza dei grandi predicatori come Savonarola, eh, la reazione è questa, l'uomo è al centro. Signorelli was less concerned about how the devil and hell fitted into the cosmic hierarchy. What obsessed him was the very real pain and suffering of the human world. In Orvieto, the violence is human. The demons are human. Even Satan himself had never looked so much like a man. Signorelli's work in Orvieto was one of the final last judgments in Western art. The reasons why the subject petered out are contained in the frescoes themselves, 
which reflect the modern world as much as traditional religious themes. The hold of religion on art was waning, and perhaps the devil just didn't appeal to artists who were now much more concerned with depicting the human world around them rather than the supernatural worlds above and below them. But while the church's monopoly on the devil may have been waning, this wasn't the end of the devil's story. There is one incredible example of what happens when artists create images of the devil, not for religious authorities, nor for the education of the masses, but for the enjoyment of a very rich individual. So I've come to Chantilly in northern France, where I hope to see how three brothers from the Low Countries reimagined Satan for Jean, Duke of Berry, who was one of France's richest aristocrats. The Duke of Berry has to be one of the most extravagant art patrons of all time. He was the son, the brother and the uncle of successive kings of France. To begin with, he collected buildings, constructing and renovating 17 chateaux. Next, he had to turn each one into an Aladdin's cave full of exotic, gleaming loot. So over the years, he amassed tapestries and jewelries, caskets, cups, chalices, statuettes, antique cameos, even one of Charlemagne's teeth, supposedly. He loved animals, and his menageries were stocked with lions and bears and swans and peacocks. He even boasted a, an ostrich and a monkey, a wolf and a leopard, as well as no fewer than 1,500 dogs. A bibliophile as well as an art lover, the Duke had a library containing around 300 manuscripts, including 14 books of hours, private devotional books which were created specifically for wealthy individuals. And because he, not the church, had commissioned them, no pope or priest would have any influence over how these books would look. One such book is the Très Richeur, begun by three brothers, Paul, Jean and Hermann Limburg, around 1412. It's one of the finest illuminated manuscripts to have survived from the late Middle Ages. Sadly, the original is too precious for me to leaf through, but as well as holding this original, the Musée Condé here in Chantilly also holds a perfect replica. So here we have uh, Saturn seated in a, in a kind of you know, bed. And, uh, Olivier Bosque is the museum's chief by, librarian. By it looks yeah. like a sort of grid It's a grill. It's a grill. Yeah, it's yeah. a grill. Yeah. There are flames beneath. Yeah, exactly. So he's almost being tortured. The devil is being tortured at the yeah. same... But he doesn't seem to no, mind no, no, too no. much. It's, it's his element, you know? <laughs> it is, yeah. There's this world, this vortex of yeah. smoke and sulphur coming out of his jaws with all of these people swirling around, these tiny little sinners in freefall. And he's surrounded by these demons who are themselves very fierce with their bat wings and um, big horns, and they have all the paraphernalia of hell, including these bellows to fan the flames. So far, so familiar. This devil's part of the tradition we've seen throughout the Middle Ages. Malevolent, inhuman. And striking though this image may be, it's not what I've come to see. That's because the Limburgs were interested in how the devil came to be this beast in a fiery hell in the first place. And they've gone right back to his 5th century origins as Lucifer, the most beautiful angel of them all, who challenged God and was expelled from heaven. This is a very famous image from the yeah. Book of Hours, from the Très Richeur. And what we see here is the fall of the rebel angel Lucifer. Exactly. He's in the middle, you know. On the top of the image, you've got God. He's surrounded by angel all around. And as you may notice, the, the, the angels are seated around him, but some of the seats are, are vacant, you know? Yes. Because uh, these angels are... The rebel angels are cast yeah, out. Exactly. So these angels that we see falling down here, yeah. um, you, we imagine they once had their seat exactly. in heaven. What's so significant about this image is that previously the devil, most of the time, looked grotesque, and yet here is the devil, and he looks beautiful. <laughs> He's a beautiful, very good-looking Apollonian man 
who has these resplendent blue robes, and with his retinue, he's falling down in this, there's a kind of V shape which draws the eye down towards the devil. And he's in the process of changing from the most beautiful angel in heaven to the devil, going down into the centre of the earth where hell was imagined to, to be. The Limburgs have captured the moment when Lucifer, the rebel angel, was cast out from heaven. And they've imagined him not as an angry, sullen, vengeful tyrant, but as a beautiful man, weeping, terrified, distraught. Where is the evil in this image? Not in Lucifer. Indeed, arguably, this is the most beautiful devil in Western art. Uh, we always figure ourselves, you know, uh, uh, the, the frontier between uh, good and evil as something very uh, uh, straight and uh, you, you were born on one side and you not cross the side. Here, it's the proof you can cross this, uh, the border, you know. And here, Falling Angel uh, scenery is uh, a proof of this duality, of uh, uh, the humanity and the duality of uh, the human character. And uh, that's why it's an important uh, work of art for, for us. In these two images, separated by only a few pages of this book, the Limburg brothers have captured the devil's split personality. They've chronicled the journey of Lucifer from angel to devil, from heaven to hell, and into the forefront of the human imagination. One image is the epitome of Satan the tyrant. The other is more haunting, depicting the heartbreaking hopelessness of Lucifer's rebellion, which would inspire generations of artists to come. The modern fascination with the dark, tragic side of our nature can be seen expressed here in this spectacular 15th century manuscript. The Limburg's Book of Hours completes the journey of the devil from the Old Testament to the edge of the Renaissance. We've come full circle, from the mysterious blue angel in Ravenna to the beautiful blue and tragic angel in Chantilly. In between, the devil has personified a terrible bestial evil while becoming more and more recognizably human. He's been the repository of our greatest fears and has, as we've come to understand him, helped us understand more about the darker side of our own natures. Above all, he is a great work of art and a very complex, very human creation. I really now believe that Leonardo da Vinci was onto something when he said, if the painter wishes to depict creatures or devils in hell, with what an abundance of invention he teems, I think the devil is dredged straight from the sulphurous depths of the unconscious. If God is Western culture's super-ego, then the arch-fiend is its id. And just as a psychotherapist finds hidden significance in a nightmare, so the fluctuating appearance of the devil reveals the darker reality of each age that dreamt him up.